Hi, I'm Ricky Kalman, and welcome to another episode of Amplify Your Mindset. Thank you for listening and watching. Truly appreciate your support. And please check out my book, Leverage Your Mindset, available online from Walmart, Target, Barnes & Noble, and my friends at Amazon. And don't forget to check out my mobile app on mindfulness and meditation. Just go to your app store and search the title, Ricky Kalman. So over the years, and I've been doing this podcast for two and a half years, I've had the great fortune of meeting new people I've never met before as guests. And then I bring on friends that I've known for a very long time. And this next gentleman is truly a superstar, fascinating, compelling. Um, he is He's a rock star. I met him almost, I, I, I want to say almost 15, 18 18 years ago, maybe 20 Let's years 20, ago. Ricky. Yeah, sure. Uh, probably I'm aging myself. Um, well, I don't even know how to, I was asking him, how do you want to be introduced? I met him. He's a fighter pilot. He's a former blue angel. He is a uh, Marine Corps reserve brigadier general. He is an actor and now an iron man. And I'll say finisher, but you're training again and you're going for it. And, um, I, 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 there's so many words that come into mind to describe you. Uh, and I keep saying rock star and you're actually doing this podcast from your training van that, um, I've, I've been following you online. First of all, Len Anderson, welcome to the program. Thank you, Ricky. It's awesome. I'm so glad we reconnected <laughs> and, to, and to see you here, uh, now this is great. Well, I, I admired, I, I was such a, a fan of the Blue Angels, and I still am of the Blue Angels, and I got a chance to not only, uh, you were so gracious, and the team got to see me live, because I was actually performing in the same town that you guys were getting into to do an air show. We had a mutual friend, I'm going to say it, Terry, uh, you know, from Lex and Terry, Terry James, and um, I, I got a chance to connect with you and the team and you invited me on literally the tarmac. I got to be on the tarmac and to feel the thrust <laughs> and be close to you were actually announcing then you weren't flying. You were actually the announcer and it was, it was pretty cool. And we've kept in touch a little bit over the years. I followed your career. You are still active in, in, in this, in service. And thank you so much for your service. I have followed you. You were in captain Phillips as an extra. And uh, I got a chance to see you there. And I, I was so proud to tell Mike, I know that guy. <laughs> um, and now I see your training for another, another Ironman. Yes, another uh, next month. It, it starts to happen quick. And I think it's more just a, a, a release of being towards the end of this pandemic, I hope, right? It's uh, just gratitude being able to actually race. We didn't have anything in 2020. There was nothing going on. So I think part of getting in the shape that I'm in now is because <laughs> I had nothing else to do but ride a bike and run. Couldn't do anything. So uh, between my Marine Corps job, after that, it was just, well, I might as well go ride a bike. That's how it started. And, and Okay. So I, I want to go back a little bit. You, you're, you serve the military. You actually served, is it four years you were in the Blue Angels? Is that correct? I, I did three years in the Blue Angels. And that's a typical tour for the Blue Angels because of how much you're traveling. And of course, you, you saw the air shows. It's pretty grueling. And I, granted, I love the flying. It's the best flying I've, I will ever do in my life. Um, but it is a little bit taxing on the body and it's a little bit taxing on your schedule and your family and so you do a few years and you move on. You have other guys that come in and, and gals that come in to do to do the job after you and get a chance because it is a it is one of the best experiences I've I've had. And of course, I would have never been there without the Marine Corps. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, fascinating to watch. Fascinating to see these these powerful uh, machines, you know, made by man, do what they do, pushing them to the limits and being able to do these exhibitions for the general public, uh, is pretty amazing to, for me, it's, it's pretty amazing. And I, and you got a chance to, to watch the, uh, cause you were also, like I said, the, the announcer at times. And what I was saying is pretty amazing to watch the audience, the, their, their mouth drop in awe of the talent that you guys have and be able to really show you know, show the talents of these incredible men and women. So after military, uh, what, what was your kind of, let's talk a little bit about this little pivot of yours. You bet. Um, it, it was quite an experience, Ricky, before I ended up on the blue angels, just, I, I had, uh, I had a little bit of a, of a scare flying off the aircraft carrier. My, my left lung had collapsed. Um, 
And I was, this was prior to the Blue Angels. And I didn't know if now I was ever going to be able to fly air shows again. And then uh, I, I healed up, was fine, got onto the Blue Angels. And then my first year flying as a solo pilot, my left lung collapsed again. So you kind of have some thoughts about maybe I shouldn't do this for, you know, the long term. <laughs> and that kind of started me down that path. You know, I was able to fly and finish my last year on the Blue Angels, but had made the decision then that I was going to leave active duty and go to the reserve side of the Marine Corps, which turned out to be the best experience for me. And you mentioned our friend, Terry, and he was very polite to me when I, I got out of the Marine Corps. I fly a I fly for a cargo company, you know, now in my civilian job. I'm a, a 757 captain. And he just looked at me in Seattle. We're, you know, overlooking South Lake Union. And he goes, really? You, are you sure you want to fly cargo the rest of your life? That's what you want to do? You don't want to say, like, don't you think you should do something in Hollywood? I was like, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure that's in the cards. And I thought about it. And we, I literally a month later had a book in my hand, the actor's guide to LA. I landed on an airplane. I rented a car and started. I had zero connections, nothing. And uh, into the, the jungles of, of LA and took me a while to figure some of it out. And certainly is an interesting industry, but I was kind of balancing FedEx, Marine Corps Reserves, and this acting career all at the same time. It was kind of three big bowling balls I was uh, was juggling. And uh, eventually, as the acting, it was consistent, a little, you know, little parts here and there. But eventually, I kept continuing to climb and rank in the Marine Corps. And that became very important to me. And I've been on and off active duty now over the last, you know, 15 years as a reservist. I think I've been on active duty for six or seven of those. So, uh it's, it's been an interesting experience to be able to come in and out of that. I know that encompasses a lot, you know, there's probably, a, there's a lot to unpack in there, but that's how I ended up on the acting side uh, out in Los Angeles. What was it like for you? Different from the military? Absolutely. Very different in the military when you're in Los Angeles. One, uh, you forget that, you know, when I'm wearing a uniform and I'm with the Marines and I'm standing next to them, I know that they've got my back. I've got theirs doesn't matter if I have if I've known them for a minute or an hour or I've known them for 10 years uh, we will all go in and, and execute a mission or you know maybe the job is here back in the United States we're gonna go we're gonna roll up our sleeves we're gonna get it done I've met a lot of great people in Hollywood but I've also met uh, the flip side of that where they're not as loyal right they're not going to be your friend they they might pretend to be your friend uh, but they're just not and it was a different tribe than we had with um, the Marine Corps. So how, how many years were you actually uh, in LA working? Oh boy. So let's see. I first started running around out there in 2007, just into eight, you know, perfect timing right at the, right at the, uh, uh, right at the market crash when, when jobs were, were hard to come by. I continued that until 2014 on and off until 2014 and the catalyst for me to leave was, quite honestly, was the ISIS invasion of Iraq. And I, and I mobilized again and went to Baghdad in 2014 to work with our Iraqi partners and um, start the, the fight against ISIS. And I, I haven't returned to L.A. since uh, since I since I've done that. I don't want to forget this. You, you're, you said your lung collapsed twice. Did, what was there a specific cause? Was it, is it um, just genetics or what, what was, what was the cause of it? Yeah. I, I think for the lung itself, there was some genetics involved. This, you know, the surgeon, the, the, the uh, he, you know, he had a couple of ideas as to why. So when they went in and repaired it, you know, they basically uh, they've glued the lung in. It's not going anywhere now, and um, it works. And I'm still able to fly, and and it, I have had zero issues. And and now you're pushing I, yourself in as an athlete, right? I doesn't. I don't. I don't. I'm not sure. I've lost too much lung capacity out of the whole deal. <laughs> so, well, uh, I I just keep going. All right. So, uh, jokingly, before we started recording, I said, you know, I follow you on online on social media, and every so often I see a picture of you, your your training van, and to me, it almost, uh, you know, it's almost like uh, Mission Impossible or like Meet the Fockers. Like it looks like this, you know, complete like command center because you've got it down to travel and train. So 
swimming, running, biking, in, in, you know, training your body and conditioning yourself. And, and tell us a little bit about, you know, your daily activities. Because I see what I see is usually you showing up pl- probably someplace uh, and it says like waiting for the pool to open. <laughs> <laughs> That's that can be a lot of my day uh, is is sometimes parked outside of places waiting for them to open. But <laughs> I, I went to I mean, a little bit of a transition. I You know, I, this probably isn't a full time thing for me, but I know here in the next few months I'm going to be moving in my reserve career, my reserve job. So. I decided to get out of an apartment a little bit early and try the van life and travel and go to some races and, and use this as a base camp, you know, this van, uh, that has my, like you said, all the gear I need and it's self-sufficient. And quite honestly, I don't have to be on airplanes. I don't have to be in hotels. It was somewhat of a pandemic idea as well. Earlier on, I've had this now for about six months and I'm still figuring it out. There's things that I just, don't you know you you either don't use or don't need and you kind of figure out what you really need when you only have the space of a van to deal with uh but day to day i have um a coach i started with a coach about a year ago to train for triathlons if there's anything i've learned either whether it's whether i was learning how to golf or how to write or you, you hire somebody right you hire a professional to help you along that path so I have a weekly schedule that I work out with him and generally it revolves around when I'm able to get pool times because I still have to reserve lanes, et cetera. So tomorrow morning, for example, I'm up at five, I'll drive out to the pool, pool opens at six, swim from six to seven or so, turn back around, drive to work, into the office at 7.30. Generally, 7.30 till probably 5.30 or 6 p.m. at night is encompassed with my current position uh, working for Marine Forces Cyber Command. And that's uh, been an incredible, incredible job. After that, though, I turn around and I'm back on a bike or I'm running and then it's a night and then you just hit repeat, Ricky. It's it. That's what the, my week is like. I, is it just me or is this just fascinating? I mean, you you have the mindset of somebody that just is constantly driven to not only build your physical body, but your mental capacity of, of service of not giving up. I mean, the core values of just, you know, your, 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 your training. Um, or is it just me? I, 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 I know that other people have to agree with this, that, you know, here you are just so casually, yeah, you know, uh, yeah. this is pretty amazing. So just a quarter of what you have done is, is, is an, incre- an incredible accomplishment. I, I'm somewhat speechless here right now. Can we talk a well, little bit, uh, you know, about your service now? And I, I know that this is, kind of, I don't want to ask you sensitive things and I'm, I'm being very careful. So it, it, what you, what you can say, that'd be awesome. Oh, sure. Uh, so what I'm, you know, what I'm doing now, and, if, and it, you, we talk about the opportunity to serve Ricky. And, and I think there's, there's a great quote that, um, I think we all as reservists, especially, or those that continue on active duty for 20, 30, 40 years, it's just this, it's, uh, it's an irrational call to serve. Like it, it, sometimes it, it, it conflicts with family, career, et cetera, but you just, there's a drive there. And I think it's a really a pull from the Marine Corps. It's something that was embedded to me. I'm going to give one quick piece before I talk about what I'm doing now. I started in Navy ROTC in Chicago. And the first day I arrived there and I saw the individuals that were going Marine Corps and I saw those that were going Navy. And while I certainly work very closely with my Navy brothers and sisters now, I knew I was in the wrong service and I had to be a Marine. So I went Marine Corps and it turned out to be the best piece for me. So here I am flying F-18s. I've flown F-18s, both active duty and the reserves for 20 years. I worked my way up through Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, and by... Um, you know, maybe some timing, maybe some luck, Uh, you know, I get selected to be a Brigadier General and certainly never expected to be there, right? And the call from the Commandant, it's really great when they, when he, when the Commandant of the Marine Corps calls and asks you where you are, what you're doing, he's like, ah, you know, so, you know, we're just, you know, it's almost, the Commandant never calls you. The Commandant of the Marine Corps never calls you. (laughs) So, (laughs) <laughs> um, and then he casually is like, well, you know, uh, you know, been selected for Brigadier General and, uh, yeah, I think we're going to send you to cyber. <laughs> okay. All right. That's, that's, um, 
sure, that sounds great. Um, you know, I can't wait. So I had about three months. That was uh, towards the end of December. And by March of 19, 2019, I had reported to Marine Forces Cyber Command. And a uh, whole domain that I was not familiar with, a lot of learning there in the first 90 days. I was spending uh, longer hours in the office then because I certainly was behind uh, the power curve. And the what is interesting here, Ricky, are the very talented individuals that we have. And while we're wearing Marine Corps uniforms and we still maintain our physical fitness and we're and at our heart, we're warriors. These are really, really talented individuals. I'm, I'll admit it. When I'm on the ops floor, there's operate. I'm like a dog watching a TV, you know, and they're typing away and, and doing their work. Um, I, I certainly admire what they do. So what I've been part of here that I can talk about is uh, Joint Task Force Ares. And what we do is we uh, basically uh, conduct operations against violent extremists online. Outside the United States, we're talking generally, uh, you know, your your jihadi um, type of, uh, of terrorists. And that's the work that I've been doing and leading uh, with uh, Marine Forces Cyber Command. So here I was, you know, first back in 2014, uh, going against ISIS. I went deployed again in 2017, and now here I am in a completely different domain uh, looking at some of uh, the activities that are going online. So it's it's completely fascinating. I'm really going to miss this job. You know, I leave here in, in uh, just a few months, but it, it was, uh, I'm so glad the Commandant uh, sent me here to do this. You, you've always, since I've known you, you've, you've, you're a very humble person, but also a very strong person. Um, for you, I, I, for you to give credit to the men and women that serve under you and serve with you, is is an incredible characteristic. I, I've met a lot of people that like to talk just about them, but you give credit as a leader yourself. Leaders, great leaders, make great leaders. And thank you for acknowledging yeah. the people around you and, and to be as so humble as you are at the same time. Um, it, it shows an incredible character of mindset. Um, every time I meet a CEO that starts out with, let me give credit to the people around me because I wouldn't be in this position if it wasn't for the people working around me. Um, we're all working together to me right off the bat. If they start talking like that, I'm like, wow, I, this, this person's fascinating to me, you know, and, and like what you just did, you give credit to the people around you that, that make up the whole team. I, I mean it. It's I and I wake up every morning hoping they stay in the Marine Corps, you know, and don't and, and don't leave because you can imagine the opportunities that are on the outside, right? For these individuals, we don't pay them a lot. Um, this is this is the military. It's not like Serviced. we're yeah, it's service. And, mm -hmm. and 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 I think the mission and some of the things that the opportunities that we that we have here are what keep you know keep Marines involved, uh, particularly in this in this domain, super challenging, always changing. You've seen, you know, recent stuff on, on the news as far as what's happening in cyberspace. It's a, it's a constantly shifting domain. There's something about giving back. Uh, recently, I had released a podcast with a gentleman. He is a, a physician. His name is Clay Louder. It's on my, my uh, podcast now. He is an author. Um, he really talks about giving back and I've never mean, met somebody so happy to give to others. And he said, I, I get even more gratification by giving to others. My family gives to others. I mean, he's just, he's a fascinating individual. So I'm going to plug that podcast that's already airing now. Uh, but he, he, in this book, Winners Travel, but again, it goes back that yeah, I, the people that I find that are the happiest inside are the ones that are giving back. And uh, with no unconditional, you know, uh, hidden agenda, but for some reason, the more they give, the more they get back from the, from, from the universe. Let's put it that way. Um, serving in the military, I, it sounds like is, is the same for you and, and for the men and women that have continued in that process. But let, let's pivot for a quick second. Um, you, you know me and you know my, my pivot over the last 20 years has been about mm -hmm. really helping people grow and about the mindset. So I'm going to ask you the question I, I often ask, what motivates you? Because life is not perfect. I'm sure that there are times that you you know, things just don't go your way or you're frustrated or whatever it may be. I, I, I'm sure there's some kind of training or maybe un, unconsciously you just pull yourself out of it. 
Is there something particular that, that's helped you create the mindset? Because you've done, like I said earlier in this podcast, you've done so many things in your life and you have so much more I know you're going to do. And it's just, what an incredible accomplishment of, of what you're doing. Well, thanks, Ricky. I, I certainly appreciate that. I'll, I'll, I'll take on that compliment because I do need some of that positive reinforcement like everybody else. It, like you said, there are bumps along the way. This isn't all perfect, whether it's going to be with family, uh, friends, you know, in, in careers, you, it's, there's some rough days, right? There's, there's rough days at work. So I, I, for mindset and long-term goal, it seems like when, for, when I make a decision, um, and it might take me a bit to get there, a week or two, but when I make a decision, I, I get into this, I just get into this mode that that's, that's what I'm going to do. And I can't really explain it for me personally, though, to take a break, I do meditate, I take time away, I, I do visualize, you saw a little bit about what we did in the Blue Angels, which is really where I first learned a lot of this. Uh, we visualize and sit down and talk through as a group, as a demonstration team, the entire flight before we even leave the room. We've already flown it once in our mind before we go and walk to the airplanes. We know the wind, we know the character, we know kind of anticipate what we want to work on, what the checkpoints are. And I think I've taken that visualization, even to you mentioning that race last weekend. I took some time right here in the in the you know in the mobile command post and visualized how I was going to go through the race. So I had done it once, you know, before I first jumped into the water and I'm not saying it went perfect. My swim did not go perfect at all. Ricky, this is the first time I've done a half Ironman and about 400 meters into the swim. It's a little bit dark. Uh, I started getting a little bit out of breath. I had to stop. I had to, I had to roll over on my back and wonder why am I doing this race? Do I, am I going to continue and then I decided to just turn over and go one buoy to the next. And I was going to make a decision. At the next buoy, I'm going to have somebody pull me out of the water. And then after the next buoy, it felt okay. And then I kept going and it kept going. About halfway through the swim, um, without realizing it, uh, I was just swimming comfortably. I was doing my thing and I wasn't in that panic mode anymore. So regardless of whether or not I've been training for a year or two for something like this, in the moment, yeah, it was... Uh, it was rough. I I was uh I didn't I didn't know which way it was going to go, but I I finished and I'm I'm actually pretty happy with the race and I look forward to trying to do something again in a few weeks. You've touched on a, several things that I talk about a lot: guided imagery, visualization, re mental rehearsal, mental conditioning. I use the example of athletes all the time. You know, athletes like you, you you train your muscles. You spend hours training your muscles, conditioning your muscles. But I truly believe the athletes that take themselves to the next level understand mental conditioning. Absolutely. You have it, to. It, it validates it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ricky, there's, there is no doubt. There is the, that is a big, it's not called a major muscle group, right? Up there in, in your, in your brain, but you can certainly um, push yourself a little bit past the limits of what you're, when, you know, when perhaps when your brain is telling you you're done or it's over, not, you know, to the point where you're hurting yourself, but you can't listen to every voice in your head. A lot of times I like to just get quiet too. You get focused, mm -hmm. get everything quiet and then, and then go and not have all these random thoughts. If I can minimize some of the noise there, that's when I could really get focused. Um, and that's, that, that, that is where I really like to be in my head. You know, you, you said something earlier that it's a great takeaway. Um, we talk about the training, we talk about the visualization, but in the moment when things happen, in the moment when you think that you might as well just give up, you can either talk yourself in and out of something very quickly. You can either say, I'm going to fail, and guess what? Your mind works to make that actually happen. You, you actually condition your brain. Once you say, I'm giving up, or I'm going to give up, or maybe I should give up, and you start leaning towards that direction of doubt, the mind accepts that's what it should do. But as you were talking about the race and swimming, conditioning yourself, pushing yourself a little bit more, setting a little bit of a goal, and then literally distracting yourself from that, that hyper intensive moment where it felt like, what am I doing? You've just kind of set the path. You changed your mindset, if you will. You changed the channel of your thoughts and you stopped thinking of were laying on your back. You kept thinking about moving your muscles, breathing, breathing differently, and then getting to from buoy to buoy and then finishing. Um, that example alone, I, I think can set 
to anybody listening, whether you're in business, a leader, sales, it doesn't make a difference. Sometimes something will happen and you go, do I give up? Or you just keep pushing forward. Uh, very, very, very quickly, I'm going to share with you an uh, interesting story. I was getting ready to do a virtual broadcast to about a thousand people. And I, we had done everything right. We had tested everything. I mean, everything to a T. I was even 30 mm-hmm. minutes early. 30 minutes early, for some reason, I could not log into the meeting room. There's a thousand people waiting. And then they were going to bring me in the room first with the executives. And it was very stressful. There was a technical issue, a technical issue that it was beyond my control and we were able to fix it. But everything I kept doing repeating wasn't working, but I kept telling myself just to stay calm because if they see me panic, I'm, I'm in trouble. Uh, you're, you're, it, and it went, it went off great and it was awesome. And I got into the room, we were seven minutes late, but we did. And we did find out with the technical issue again, it wasn't, it wasn't me, but that's okay. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, the m- most important thing that I mean, I'm saying is that not to panic, not to panic. And that's probably in your training over the years in the military. And even as an actor, don't panic, you know, don't just stay, stay in the moment, stay on, stay on stage. I, yeah, I kind of I, I went long there. Sorry. No, 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 Ricky. I, I hear you that you're right. It's <clears throat> you have to, you do have to stay in the moment with, uh, with times like that. And, and to your point, be calm. We talk a lot about when, when we're learning how to shoot on the rifle range of the Marine Corps, smooth is fast. It's not, you know, you're not trying to rush anywhere. Smooth is fast. You just take your time. You know, you're doing everything as you've been taught. And that's usually how things are going to work out, you know, best for somebody that's, that's struggling through, you know, whatever aspect of training that we're doing in the Marine Corps. So uh, I, I, I hear you on that piece. I think some of the training for you mentioned acting, you know, I was pretty successful up until I had gone out to LA and hearing no or not getting hired. I, I think I, <laughs> I think I needed that. Um, and I got a lot of no's, a ton, a ton of no's. Uh, well, did you ever and, say, and that, do you know who you're talking to? Do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> I almost did. There was one time when I almost did, Ricky. I think my biggest uh, disappointment out there was auditioning for the movie Avatar. No kidding. <laughs> for the role of Marine Aviator, all right? <laughs> That's the role. That's the role, I'm not kidding. I can't make it up. So I go in, <laughs> I've got this. I mean, I've got all the lingo, I've got it all. Nothing, Ricky. Didn't even get a call. I couldn't even, I was a Marine Aviator and I couldn't get it. So that was a, that was a good moment for me too. That was a good humbling moment. <laughs> that's, that's that's almost like me going into a, a, you know audition for a hypnotist no sorry sorry you, no not not even a callback right yeah nothing nothing <laughs> so you know you just kind of shake it off but I, but that certainly you know i hope you laughed. You know, i hope you laughed about that though i did i still i'm laughing about it now right 15 years <laughs> later whatever the heck it was i can't even remember so of course you know now that yeah. you you move on and you have different successes in life. It's, it's, it's fine. What, it's uh, fine. let's see. Uh, I know you were in, cause I saw you in captain Phillips. Yes. Um, great story else? there too, by the way, go for it. Go for it. Oh, okay. Cause this was, uh, through a mutual friend out in LA. He was a producer, Dana Brunetti. He's also did uh, House of Cards. He produced that. He produced The Social Network. He's got some other things now under, uh, I think his uh, shingle is Calvary Media. He's still uh, somewhat active. And I still do reach out and I'm in touch with him. He's on Malta. That's where that movie was filmed, Captain Phillips, uh, because the sister ship to the Maersk Alabama was there. Tom Hanks is out there. They're, they're, filming on site they go out on the boat every day come back at sunset well they had hired some folks to take over the bridge of the of the Marisk Alabama like you saw in the movie and it was actors they didn't know how to hold weapons they didn't they didn't know how to even have their gear on you know helmets are backwards it was it was bad so he calls me from Malta where are you so I'm in Memphis at the time I was in the reserves and flying for FedEx said uh can you get to Europe if you get anywhere in Europe, I can fly you down to Malta. I need somebody to lead this team to come up. Cause he knew I was acting. I had a couple little parts and, and uh, I said, absolutely. I'll be there. And, uh, 
I wasn't on the schedule for FedEx. So I jumped on a FedEx airplane though, did a jump seat, got over to Europe. He flew me down. It took 12 days of me sitting on the rooftop pool of the Hilton Intercontinental Malta, waiting for them to call me to go down to the, uh, to the ship for that 10 seconds you saw um, in that movie. But I did get to see Tom Hanks and spend a week and a half on Malta and uh, what a great experience. So yeah, I, I have to give credit to Dana Brunetti on there on that one for giving me the call and letting me come out and do that. But what an experience, right? I think about it now and I was just so in the moment, Ricky, of you know, getting hired, getting a job, speaking role, I'm in the union, this is all good, you know, I'm, this is my big break, I'm coming out, you know? And uh, yeah, 10 seconds of a darkened, darkened screen. It was good, it was, I, I enjoyed it. That's, that's really funny. Uh, my brother-in-law is an interesting, he kind of reminds me of you, he's a jack, jack of all trades. Um, he's an actor, he went to the Citadel, uh, lawyer, uh, he's just done a little bit of everything. One day um, he calls and says, uh, hey, um, uh, th- there's a TV show filming in, and I- I'm going to I'm going to forget the show, but they were filming in Charleston and um, mm-hmm. they needed somebody to show them. Uh, well, it's a long story, but he-, he was literally showing them how to either do, you know, march or hold weapons. And so sa- same same thing. I think he was it was wild. And then he calls one day. Oh, I'm doing a ha- House of Cards episode. You know, I just. <laughs> But he's not, I mean, it's like he's so talented and he just jumps into these things. Um, and it's just the mindset of, sure, I could do it. I'll do it. But why not? You know? Why not? Uh, why not? Well, what else were you in? You were going to say, what else were you in besides House of Cards? Oh, uh, oh, I wasn't in the House of Cards. The producer, he, he's, he did that show, but I was in uh, what, 13 oh, I'm sorry, hours? Yes. Yeah. yeah, 13 hours. Uh, I'm in a lot of the Transformers movies, but you only hear my voice. So when you hear pilot communications, some of the over tracks with, uh, with Transformers, that's me. And I think three or four of those movies, I, I, that started because of a quick show uh, called Castle. I did some uh, basically yeah. voiceover for a drone uh, piece on Castle. And then I had a friend of mine uh, and also manager he at the time he was at Brillstein, uh, Peter Gallagher. He said, hey, they're looking for somebody that's done Top Gun and uh, to work with Michael Bay. <laughs> OK, that sounds awesome. Um, I would love to do that. Uh, how do I how do I do? How do I work with Michael Bay? You know, so, <laughs> and uh, that's how 13. Uh, so this is leading up to the 13 hours piece. So I'm doing the voiceover. So he calls me in to his office, sits down, shows me, uh, you know, the unreleased Transformers footage that he's got and says, what, what, what would pilot say here? And I just rattled off a couple of things, a couple of things, a couple of things. He's like, that's great. All right, let's go to the studio. So we went into the studio and literally my first Transformers experience was just rattling off, watching the movie play, rattling off some comms with Michael Bay standing there, you know, hitting, you know, hitting the record button. And that's how it started. And I, kept doing a few more. And then when 13 hours came up, we were doing that very same thing. And then he decided, you know, I think I need a scene where we actually show the pilots, you know, kind of going through a brief. Do you think you'd be able to do that? And Ricky? (laughs) Yes. You know, as you just nod your head. Yes, Mr. Bay, I would love to (laughs) be in your movie. Uh, Very cool story. So we go, we grab some flight suits, some other uh, people that are going to be extras uh, in the background. And they bring us into a bus, kind of mini bus, and into Bel Air. We're going up Bel Air. We're going to Michael Bay's house, going to his house. We get there, and his whole back wall has these big transformer pistons on it, opens up, you know, the whole wall, looks down into Bel Air, and it's awesome. And Michael Bay shows up. I take over his office. I write stuff on the whiteboard behind me. All that stuff you see in the movie, I wrote on there as if I'm writing a fighter pilot board. And then he came in with the camera and just said, go. There was no script. There was nothing. And I, again, just ad-libbed through normal pilot stuff that we do all the, every day in the Marine Corps. And, it, and it, it worked out okay. Michael Bay liked it, so he kept it in the movie. And that's 13 hours. Amazing. You see, announce, announce it, yeah, yeah. You know, years later, you're, you're still announcing. You know, from the Blue Angels being the announcer, now you're still your voice is still being used. Uh, that's so awesome, yeah. um, Lynn. I I could keep you on for another hour. Um, you really are uh, an incredible individual. Um, uh, uh, thank you again for your service. 
and I, I want you to come back and share more. Um, it, it's Anytime. great reconnecting with you again. It was just awesome. Uh, thank you so much. I, I really do appreciate it. And would you, you've got another Ironman coming up here in, uh, in yeah. just a few weeks. At the time this airs, it might've already uh, gone. Uh, it might've already happened. When is, when is it? When is the Ironman? Oh boy. This is so May 15th. It's Gulf coast, Panama in Panama city. Yeah. Looking forward to okay. that. So I, I'm, I'm glad I've dipped my toes back into the social media landscape. I had taken a little hiatus and, I'm certainly glad that we're now uh, connected because I would I would love to talk to you some more. Yeah, it'd be great. Reach out to me after the the Iron Man. I would love to to hear about that. And uh, okay. th thanks again for your friendship. Thanks again for your service. This has been awesome. All right, thanks, Ricky. It's been my pleasure. Thanks.